Hi, everyone. Welcome to LA Louver. Um, I am Beatrice Shen. I'm the assistant director here. And I wanted to take this moment to thank you all for coming out to the first evening of our summer programming in conjunction with Ben Jackal's Reign of Fire and Keenholz exhibitions. I hope you've all had a chance to spend some time with Ben Jackal's most recent sculptures that are a striking meditation on the recent political climate as well as his long-standing interest in the instruments of warfare, as well as Ed and Nancy Keenholz's ever-relevant and powerful works upstairs. While it was not our original intent during and after we had planned these two exhibitions, it was obvious to us that Ben and Keenholz's artworks are pertinent statements about our society, history, and current state. We wanted to take the opportunity this summer to engage with the implied and embodied themes in their art and open up further discussion and thought to the real issues of humanity and war through other expert opinions and perspectives. I also encourage everyone to check out our online website where we have a great e-catalog documenting Ben's works from 2007 till today. And we have some really great video footage of Ben working on the USS I Iowa and in Palm, Palm Desert um, creating his sculptural works. I also encourage everyone to pick up and read the wonderful review on Ben Jackal's show that just came out today by LA Times chief art critic Christopher Knight that is very timely and references a lot of our current political issues. We also have some hard copies at the front desk if you want to pick them up afterwards. And aside from this evening's program, I also wanted to mention that we will be hosting a night of protest songs next Wednesday, August 23rd, and a special screening of the Songbird of Manzanar the following Wednesday on August 30th. And we'd be happy to answer any questions you have about these events later. Tonight, however, we are honored to host John Emery and Dr. Rory Cox, who will discuss the history of warfare and development of human ethics. John R. Emery is a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at University of California, Irvine, and a lecturer of National Security for the Master of Arts in International Studies program at Chapman University. His works on drones and counterterrorism has been published in the Peace Review and Ethics and International Affairs. Dr. Rory Cox is a lecturer in late medieval history at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and co-editor of the journal Global Intellectual History, he has published widely on the historical development of the just war tradition, medieval pacifism, and the relationship between ethics, laws, and conduct of war. Luckily for us, he is a visiting fellow at Caltech and Huntington Library in Pasadena for the year. Please save any questions for our guest speakers and Ben Jackal, who is here today, for after the discussion. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Rory Cox. I wanted to just uh, say a few thank yous before we get started. First of all, thank you to Ben, of course, for creating these uh, incredible works in the first place that we brought us here today to actually be able to discuss, and his wife, Nina, who's, who's with him tonight. Also, a big thank you to Beatrice for inviting uh, myself and, and John in the first place to talk. And also, uh, a thank you to a person who's not here, um, Daniel Brunstetter, who's a professor at UC Irvine and uh, John's supervisor. Um, and he probably would have been here talking in my place, um, but he's swanned off to the south of France. So I'm afraid you've got me instead. Uh, so it's fortuitous that I was able to be here. Um, uh, so thank you very much. Um, I'm simply going to go first because in chronological order that makes sense. As, as Beatrice says, I'm a sort of a medievalist and, and look at the ancient world. So there's a few things that I want to talk to you uh, about um, before handing over to John. And the first of all, I'll, I'll talk about the the emergence and the development of thought about war in terms of its justice and in terms of ethics, i.e. its legitimacy. How people say, yes, you can use this type of violence, no, you can't use this type of violence. And then I'll also want to talk to you a little bit about how this affects humans, you know, the, how this actually affects the community, um, whether through waging war on others or having violence and war waged on themselves. What is the human impact of war? And this is obviously a key um, theme with, with Ben's exhibition. Then I'll also go on and talk a little bit about the technology and, and the impact of technology over time and, and how we might think about military technology and what it tells us about 
cultural norms and, and the way we, we see ourselves in societies, um, whether it's aesthetics or morals or, or whatever you, you may take it to be. Okay, so to start off then, what are sort of the earliest evidence we have for ethical considerations of war? Well, it, it may surprise you that there's pretty good evidence from at least the third millennium BC. So that's around 2800, 2900 BC. And you can find that in ancient Egypt. Um, Old Kingdom Egypt, Middle Kingdom Egypt, and New Kingdom Egypt, these are the, the, the cultures that you know, create the famous sort of architecture of the pyramids and, and the Sphinx at Giza and so forth. But we have pretty good evidence that in Egypt, they created a justification for war based around their conception of cosmic order. They had a, 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 an idea of ma'at, and this was personified as a female goddess, and it basically embodied ideas of truth and justice and love and order and creation. And this creative principle of ma'at, which was embodied in the pharaoh himself, had an opposite. And that opposite was called isfet. And this was a destructive force. It was disorder. It was chaos. It was destruction. It was evil. And so the Egyptians conceived of their wars against others as an exercise of ma'at, i.e. an exercise of justice. They were wars of improvement for the world because they expanded this idea of cosmic harmony. Of course, this was good for the Egyptians because they said, well, my art resides in Egypt and, and the pharaoh is, is the guardian of my art. And everyone outside of Egypt is embodied by isfet, is embodied by destruction. So essentially every Egyptian war was a just war, okay, which, which, which obviously suited their purposes quite nicely. But we have here evidence, therefore, of really from the very earliest complex human communities of a need to start thinking about violence on ethical terms. To start, just rather than just using violence unthinkingly as a tool to, say, acquire resources, we want that water, we want that land, we want those people as slaves, rather actually starting to say, well, we're, we want that, but we're doing it for other reasons. We're doing it to extend justice, yeah? And we're, we're not gonna go, you know, most cultures have a, a, an idea of the afterlife, and the Egyptians certainly did, as is evidence in you know, mummification. They took the afterlife very seriously indeed. They had the idea of the weighing of souls. When you died as an Egyptian, your soul would be weighed against a feather, and the feather symbolized ma'at. And if your soul was heavier than the feather, you, it got eaten by a demon. So, so the Egyptians are very worried about how their souls would be judged in the afterlife. And violence and their uses of violence were very much connected to that. Now, as we kind of history progresses, these ethical considerations of war are also evinced in other cultures. And, and perhaps ancient Greece is, is a familiar example to some of you. And again, a nice example of how famous philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle conceived of war. So both of these Greek philosophers, again, thought of war as potentially good and potentially bad. And they even thought of it as natural. They thought it was natural that Greeks, Hellenes, they called themselves, would wage war against barbarians. Now, who were barbarians? Well, the Barbaroi were everyone who didn't speak Greek. So again, you have this quite nice sort of cultural othering. War against these inferior non-Greek races, according to Plato and Aristotle, was natural and it was just. This was just a product of, of human nature. War between Greeks, and there were lots of wars between Greeks, Sparta and Athens and the Peloponnesian War being most famous, they saw not as war but as a sickness. This was like a, a sort of a fratricidal war, I suppose you could call it, that it was, it, was, it was something unnatural. So again, you have this division of violence between the natural and the just, Greeks against non-Greeks, and the unnatural and the unjust, this evidence of sickness of war between Greeks. This, again, is taken into Rome, Rome, the Romans were very legalistic. They, they loved law. Um, the creation of Roman law text was very famous. And so the writers like Cicero took these ethical considerations and tried to create a framework of law which again justified Roman actions against their enemies and against their competitors. And this is where we start to see, I suppose, the, the formalization of what has later come to be called the just war tradition. And this is central to, say, international law today and, and, and how we think of um, the right of self-defense within, um, say, the UN.
and the Security Council. So Cicero said that you needed two things to, to, to use violence justly, and that was proper authority, i.e. the authority of the emperor, and a just cause. And these two ideas, I'll come back to you later, because they really are central to how violence is, is justified throughout history. Okay, so that's so a very brief introduction to how the ethics of war and the justice of war begins to emerge around the Mediterranean, the Levant, and, and Europe. I could talk about China as well, which has its own tradition, um, particularly around the concept of Ibing, which is, again, righteousness connected to the emperor, but that's too much to talk about uh, in the time that I have. Um, so what about the effect on people? Well, what I've talked about so far is very much focuses on what we call the right to go to war. In Latin, this is called the jus ad bellum tradition, the right to wage war. The effect on people is often referred to as the jus in bello tradition. That is rights or justices in war, right, rather than rights and justices to go to war. And, well, do we have evidence of limitations of violence in early warfare? Well, the simple answer is not much, <laughs> very little. Um, it sucked to, uh, <laughs> to, be, to be in war. It, it, well, it sucks to be in war, uh, full stop, you could argue, but particularly so in the ancient world. There were no institutionalized limitations or regulations of violence. It was very much seen, because war was um, conceived uh, as, a, as, as, a sort of, as an action of justice and often divine justice, therefore the enemy was demonized and was at the complete mercy of the victor. You could kill civilians, soldiers alike, you could enslave them, that was more profitable, but it really was up to the victor. They had no rights, as we might think of in the modern world, absolutely no rights whatsoever. There begins to be some evidence for immunities however, in, say, Greek warfare. Immunities for inviolable sacred space. So the most famous example of this is the oracle at Delphi, or, say, the truce during the Olympic Games. This was traditionally during the Olympic Games in Greece. Um, all the city-states would abide by this sacred truce where they wouldn't essentially go and attack another city while their best and bravest were off competing in the Olympic Games. So we do start to have um, ideas, at least, that certain places, i.e. temples or, or sacred places, certain peoples, um, priests, um, and, and beginning to be ideas about uh, women and children, should be at least not, not necessarily completely immune, but should be guarded from the worst excesses of warfare. And so, and then we're, so we're talking around 500 BC here, 500 to 800 BC, so again, quite early. So, on the one hand, we have a very sort of um, a broad idea about legitimating violence. Most, most communities thought that violence could be used legitimately for their own ends um, up to the first millennium BC. But we also have the emergence of ideas that when using violence, there are certain categories of how you use it and against whom. And that there's some protections and some immunities begin to emerge. Okay. Well, what about then technology? Because technology is obviously a key theme in, in uh, the, the exhibition, and essentially many of the, the works are um, recreations, representations of pieces of military technology. Technology in, in the early world, and this is true whether it's the ancient world or the uh, medieval world and going into the early modern world, was essentially seen as a means to enhance your chances of attaining victory. This idea of certain technologies being bad, like, say, chemical warfare, which I know John's going to talk about, or nuclear warfare, um, or biological warfare, this wasn't really conceived. Yeah? The, the, the better weapon you had, the, m the greater chance you had of securing victory. And this was seen as a good thing. In fact, from the art history of the ancient world, you often see pieces of military technology being kind of uh, lauded and, and celebrated with bodies kind of strewn everywhere all over the ground and the king's kind of trampling on people and beheading people. You know, it's pretty grisly stuff. There's n so there's no sense of a moral judgment being made on military technology. Quite the opposite. If it's effective, it's good. Yeah? And, this, and this comes back to the idea of 
as a victor or as a, as a just warrior, you are doing good in killing people. Now, there is some some evidence of attempts to limit technology. Uh, in Greece, there is some evidence that uh, archery was was limited. But again, this really betrayed class um, distinctions more than anything else. The dominant uh, soldiers of the day were what were called hoplite warriors. You may have seen kind of uh, images of them with their big bronze armor, huge um, shield, and a long spear. Now, these hoplite warriors represented essentially the bourgeois class or the, or the noble class, and they fought with spear and shield. Archery, therefore, was inimical to their interests because it was used by the lower classes, you know, people who couldn't afford that bronze armor, those shields, those spears. Therefore, to limit archery was actually a way of entrenching their economic status. The same is true when we get to the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, there are some attempts in canon law, which is the law of the church, to uh, ban the use of bows and crossbows in wars against Christians. Okay, that's an important note. It's fine to use these things in wars against infidels. You know, go for it. But in wars against Christians, there was some attempt in the 12th century to ban bows and crossbows because they were seen as too ferocious. Again, though, this is actually really representative of the dominant military class, i.e. the knighthood, the nobility, because they did not fight with bows and crossbows. They fought on horseback with a sword, with a lance, with an axe sometimes, or a morning star, or a mace. You know, pick your, pick your weapon, but it wasn't a bow or a crossbow. And they were actually vulnerable to these forms of weapons. So again, trying to ban and prohibit these uh, this, this weapons technology, I guess you could say, was actually really more of a product of entrenching class interests. And those interests were of the knighthood. So, you know, this, this, this relationship between technology and, and class, I think is actually quite interesting, particularly when we start to talk about gunpowder. Now, as you've, you've seen going around Ben's exhibition, <coughs> artillery forms a, a major part of it. Um, the emergence of artillery in, in the Western world, and these are, on, on, these are, these are Western cannon that, that Ben has, has created, this happens in around the, the early 14th century. Gunpowder as a recipe was, was created in China, as, as I'm sure some of you will know, in the 12th century. It gradually makes its way west through the Muslim world in, in, into Europe. And the first um, recipe for gunpowder is from a, a Franciscan uh, called Roger Bacon, who writes it down in 1260. By the early 14th century, so that's the 1300s, cannon are starting to be used. And actually, the first recorded use of a cannon in a battle is at the Battle of Crecy between the English and the French during the Hundred Years' War. And the, fr uh, the English use cannon against the French, probably not very effectively. Interestingly, one of the things that the Battle of Crecy is famous for among medieval historians is that the longbow became famous for completely decimating the French knighthood. It sort of really produced a, a shock in medieval Europe and was backed up again at the Battle of Agincourt 100, well, just under 100 years later, about 70 years later. Now, I think it's interesting that at this battle where you have missile weapons completely undermining the military dominance of the knighthood, the French knighthood, you also have a missile weapon being used for the first time, which is gunpowder. Now, as I've mentioned, there was a hostility towards archery in the Middle Ages. And actually, I'm, I'm not swearing at you, but this sign, do people know the history of this sign? Yeah? This is the sign that English archers would give the French, because if English archers were caught by the French, they would have their two bow fingers cut off. Okay? <laughs> So, so this sign was created by English archers saying, look, you haven't caught me. I've got my bow fingers and I'm going to shoot you. Okay, so and that's, that's how that um, sign was, was created. So I apologize for using lewd uh, visions. That's lewd in your nation, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Is, 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 oh, sorry. Is this not familiar to you? Well, it's a ah, thing here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does not mean peace. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're, if you're in the UK and you're kind of posing for a photo, make sure it's that way, right? Um, but of course, that was used by Churchill. Um, that was used by Churchill very uh, deliberately. 
as 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 a basically an inversion of of, of go f yourself. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> I diverge. Um, okay, so going back to topic, um, gunpowder. Okay, so so gun. The, the interesting thing about gunpowder and the emergence of artillery weapons is that. Really, in many ways, artillery weapons are the ultimate non-discriminating non weapon. And particularly Ben's um, sculptures of the mortars, um, that you have several examples of mortars. I mean, a mortar is, is so non-discriminating. You know, you literally you set it up outside a walled city or a fortification, and you go, boom, and it goes over the wall, and it drops. Often these were charged, so when it dropped, it would then have a, a, an explosive device. Well, the, the, entire, the entire shell was explosive. It would then burst, and it would kill and destroy whatever was close to it. Usually civilians, if it was the case of besieging a walled town. Now, I think the fact that the drones have been hung above those mortars is actually a really interesting juxtaposition because the drones, of course, claim to be incredibly discriminating, that they are pinpoint accuracy, that you can use them to assassinate individuals. So the, the juxtaposition of the drones and the mortars, I think, is, is very interesting indeed. But in terms of the in, in medieval warfare, what's surprising, perhaps, is that, well, we, we know that there is this hostility towards archery. What we don't see is the same hostility towards um, artillery when it emerges. It takes about 100 years for really effective artillery to be created in the Middle Ages. So it emerges in the early 14th century. It's not really until about 1400, the beginning of the 15th century, that you start to get powerful cannon capable of knocking down walls or capable of being taken to a field of battle and used against uh, infantry or cavalry. And actually, you can always spot a, a really early cannon because an early medieval cannon doesn't have trunnions. And the trunnions, so let's pretend this is the cannon, the trunnions are the little bits at the side which form the cruciform shape. And this was uh, an actually really important little invention that occurred in the 15th century because before they invented those trunnions, which act as a pivot, the only way to change the position of the cannon was to basically shove stuff under it, okay? So it wasn't a particularly mobile or a flexible piece of um, equipment. As soon as you put those trunnions on, the two little bits on the side, you can, you can pivot it and you can change the aim in a matter of seconds rather than hours. So if it's got trunnions, you know it's at least mid 15th or late 15th century. Okay, so there's a little a bit of advice to you. But um, the, 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 the introduction of cannon was very quickly integrated into chivalric culture. Now this may seem sort of uh, surprising because chivalry is obviously about the knight, it's about hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's about honor. Artillery doesn't really seem to fit that mold. And yet, as soon as artillery is invented and, and introduced on a large scale, you see, say, chivalric coats of arms, that is the kind of the badges of honor for medieval noble families, you start to see artillery being depicted on coats of arms. I.e. it is being integrated within elite aristocratic culture. And I think the reason for this is that it was seen as a kind of a sexy new technology. It was also incredibly expensive. And it was only the aristocracy, the dukes uh, and the kings, who could actually invest in artillery. So it was, again, we might think of it as in economic terms, that artillery was not available to the lower classes. Therefore, it could be integrated into elite culture. It was completely non-discriminating but nevertheless, it was integrated into that culture. Okay, just a couple more uh, points that I wanted to make. The, you know, as a medievalist, obviously the two, the two, or the, the two collections of, of pieces that, that sort of drew my attention um, were the, the helms, the three helmets, and the, the two axes, the axe heads, the monumental axe heads. I want to just say a quick word about the axes and the helmets before I pass over to John. The axes, I think, are interesting and, and beautiful for a number of reasons. But axes are among the, the most ancient weapons. But, of course, originally, arguably, that they, they weren't weapons. An axe is, 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 is distinct in many ways because, unlike a sword, an axe has a very utilitarian purpose. You use an axe to chop wood. You use an axe to chop down a tree. You can use an axe to make axes, and I think Ben's decision to carve those axe heads 
with axes, the Swedish axes, I think you were saying, is, is, is a very good expression of this multi-functionality of these weapons or tools. What are they? So very much unlike, a, say, a, 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 a sword or, or, or something else like that. Now, that means that the axe in itself has, has a, a potential for violence against other humans, but it also has a potential for sort of a positive potential yeah, of life, you know, chopping down firewood to keep yourself alive, for example, or, or agricultural use, whatever it may be, or, or just used to make beautiful things like Ben has done, uh, an, an aesthetic use. But it also kind of hides the fact that weapons can also be in our homes and be part of our lives in the sort of a quotidian everyday sense. And that's sort of this, this hidden violence or this sort of silent violence that weapons can possess. And, in, and, and, as, and as a Brit coming to America, I think this is particularly true of, say, of American gun culture, that you have weapons in your homes which people perhaps don't even think about. They may be in a drawer, they may be an heirloom. And, and yet there's a certain, there's a kind of a silence of violence in an ax. And I think that's also true perhaps in, in certain households within the US as well. You may completely disagree with me, but that's just a kind of an outsider's um, observation. And the other observation I want to make about the helmets, again, fantastic, beautiful pieces of work. Um, uh, I, I, I would probably, I, I know if I don't know, I'm going to embarrass myself here, I would say that the, the eldest is probably late 14th century, the, the, the jousting helm is late 14th century, early 15th century, and the other pieces are, 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 are 15th century and early 16th century. Um, and but on each of the helmets, of course, you can't see the face. And this idea of the faceless killer has, has been a powerful kind of symbolic idea within Western culture for a long time. You still see it uh, expressed through horror movies, whether it's Scream or, you know, the, uh, the mad guy with the, the, the chainsaw and the hockey mask. But this idea that you can't see the face of the person doing you violence is completely embodied in the medieval helmet. And, and you know, written large in, in, in Ben's um, kind of monumental version of those helms that he's created. But it's also those helmets, and particularly the, the, the middle helm, are meant to be pieces that are aesthetically pleasing. Armor became, and, and swords as well, but armor was used as a way to express status and prestige, but also artistic talent. And again, we have this strange blending of violent potential with artistic potential. You can see in various museums around the world, you know, beautifully decorated armor. Many people would say a sword in itself can be beautiful. Say the, 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 the samurai katanas, the Japanese swords. You know, there is, a, there is a, a minimalism and a beauty about those things. And you know, looking at, say, Ben's renditions of the um, uh, representations of the drones, you know, there is a beauty in these objects. And I think that speaks to kind of a a complex and a dark side of human nature that we can find beauty and attraction and desirability in objects that we know are potentially lethal and are often designed to be lethal, not only to ourselves and to others. Now I'm gonna stop on that note and hand you over to my, I could drone on forever, I prepared that one earlier, uh, and, and, and hand you over to my much more engaging colleague, John. Thank you very much for listening. I just wanted to say thank you again uh, for the gallery, uh, for the invitation for Rory and I to speak here, and to Ben Jackal's incredible Reign of Fire exhibition. It's really an honor to sit here and discuss a little bit. And I am going to sit because, as a political scientist, I have a few more statistics, which I don't memorize like his dates as the historian. And I always enjoy presenting with Rory, and it's difficult to follow him because his accent just makes him sound so much more intellectual. But we'll get, we'll get through this together. <laughs> uh, and what I want to talk about a little bit today is the evolution of technology in warfare. And this is kind of and the contradiction between the ideas of liberalism, human rights, and what many have deemed the Western or American way of war, which is absolute victory with speed and efficiency. And I feel like this kind of central contradiction is really embodied by the monumental statue of Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, ben and I were discussing before, uh, before this talk that, you know, on the one hand, Teddy Roosevelt is this great conservationist, um, very avid sportsman, um, 
but on the other hand, he was quite the imperialist as well. You know, in order to create the Panama Canal for, as his gift to humanity, as he put it, um, and also encouraged Texan expansion into Mexico. You know, the inevitable good of humanity for the Americans to crowd out the Mexicans, as Teddy put it. Texans cannot submit to the mastery of a weaker race. So you can see this contradiction. On the one hand, he was very much a humanitarian and was framing his kind of imperialism under the guise of humanitarian values. And we see that kind of throughout the history and evolution of technology and warfare. So the centrality of my talk uh, focuses on what is the main focus of my work, which is how we've come to view technology as creating war as an inherently more ethical space. How is technological innovation, how does technological innovation lead to a more ethical war or an easier war? So I'll talk from World War I to Trump today. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll pretty much just focus on one aspect of each one that I find enlightening because I've got about a page of notes on Trump because I know that's what we're all most interested in. So in World War I, I think uh, Ben's rendition of the gas mask is quite interesting on the one level because we had 75,000 scientists, the Allies did, working on the development of chemical weapons. And the most dangerous and deadly chemical weapon, which was never actually used, was called lewisite. Now it was very similar to mustard gas, caused similar vomiting, skin irritation, etc. But the difference was, it didn't have to be inhaled like mustard gas. If it could touch the skin, it could kill a man in a minute. And at a concentration of 50 parts per million, which is not very much. And what the creator of Lewisites uh, said was, it is the most efficient, most economical, most humane, single weapon known to the military service. So framing his weapon of death as a humane weapon. This is kind of a common theme that we'll see. And when chemical weapons came about, there were basically three schools of thought that debated um, whether or not they were ethical in warfare. The first school that basically said it's not chivalrous, it should be banned. The second school, which basically said they're repugnant weapons, but quite effective, so we should use them. And then the third, which viewed them as genuinely humane. Now the creator of Lewisite was not just in some self-justification. This was pretty prominent at the time. And we saw just the horrors of World War I. For example, at the Battle of the Somme, um, in a little under six months, in five months in 1916, over a million casualties in the battle. The first day, the British lost 57,000 men alone. So just massive scales of casualty, not to mention the horrors that chemical weapons saw. There are great poets and diaries from World War I that really capture the horror of when the gas was released into the trenches. But after that, we saw the chemical weapons ban in 1925 in Geneva, and there were no chemical weapons used in World War II. So we'd kind of rid the world of that evil, if you'd say. Then comes World War II. And what's interesting and a common theme throughout warfare today is when you confuse the means of war with the ends of war, you think that an increased technology in war will guarantee you a victory. If we just have better technology, better computing power, better tanks in World War II, that we could win. What's interesting is Germany and France had relatively equal technology. The French had the Maginot Line, as well as about 500 more tanks than the Germans. However, it was the doctrine, it was the strategy that Germany had of Blitzkrieg and going through the forest of the Ardennes, which the French thought was impassable, that allowed them to conquer France in 40 days. Relatively matched technologically and 40 days to conquer France. So you can see that technology itself is not the sole determinant of victory in warfare. Then we come to nuclear weapons. Nukes grew out of the history of mankind, but yet threatened to end history as we know it. It grew out of the inventions of human beings, but threatened to annihilate human beings from the face of the planet. 
And there's an interesting comparison, a famous quote from Oppenheimer, one of the nuclear scientists, that is a real contrast to the inventor of Lewisite. Now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. You see a lot more guilt. He's not framing his weapon as humane. Even those that launched the atomic bombs against Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they very much framed it in utilitarian terms. You know, we saved five million people by not invading Japan, but very few of them argued that this was humanitarian. Later on, when we got to mutually assured destruction, many said it was the most humanitarian thing. There are actually scholars today that think everyone should have nukes because then we won't go to war with each other. I don't recommend it, but it's humanitarian because it avoids war, right? And then we come through the Cold War, um, and what's interesting about that is not just nuclear weapons, but the rise of computers, computing power, advanced mathematics, game theoretical modeling. So we had this perfect storm of the power to destroy the world and the technology and the mathematics and computing power to really understand how we can use these weapons most effectively. And what we had is we abstracted war from its very human elements. War became numbers. And war became more of a technological problem to be solved rather than you know, hand to hand combat or the bow and arrow. And with this, we saw technological hubris begin to develop. That's kind of always been present, but especially developed as the United States pulled far ahead in its technological innovation. So during the Vietnam War, for example, intelligence gathering was huge. We would gather massive amounts of intelligence, listen to radio broadcasts, etc., and we fed this intel into computing systems and advanced algorithms to determine the progress of the war. And as we all know, we didn't win the Vietnam War, but the models kept showing us that we were winning, we were killing people, we were taking all of this. One National Security Council member said that 95% of our intelligence was on collection, i.e. how many hours of radio broadcast did you record? Well, only 5% was on actual analysis of it. So the different departments of war were judged on how much data they collected, not how well they analyzed that data. And even in the Vietnam War, we saw massive amounts of indiscriminate bombing. So for example, in our secret bombing of Cambodia, we, had, we dropped 2.7 million tons of munitions. That's a million more than all of Japan, including the atomic weapons during World War I and II. And on the country of Laos, we dropped a plane load of bombs every eight minutes for nine years. Right? So very different from the precision of drones today, which we'll talk about later. You know, just massive scales of carpet bombing, which Trump wanted to bring back, but hasn't yet. So this increase in technology doesn't lead you to question your strategy. It leads you to increase technology even further, and that will guarantee you victory. So General Westmoreland, the commander in chief of the US forces in Vietnam, had a very prescient speech um, in 1969 called The Future of War. And you can see that he missed ideas of strategy and focused on technology. So I'll quote him. On the battlefield of the future, enemy forces will be located, tracked, and targeted almost instantaneously through the use of data links, computer-assisted intelligence evaluation, and automated fire control. With first-round kill probabilities approaching certainty, and with surveillance devices that cont continually track the enemy, the need for large forces to fix the opponent becomes less important. I see battlefields under 24-hour real-time or near-real-time surveillance of all types. I see battlefields on which we can destroy anything we can locate through instant communications and almost instantaneous application of highly lethal firepower. In summary, I see an army built on and around an integrated control system that exploits the advanced technology, communication sensors, fire direction, and the required automatic data processing. It was as if I were reading something either from a sci-fi novel back then or our playbook in drone warfare today. So you can see there was no reflection on how we lost the Vietnam War because of a lack of a grand strategy. The solution 
was an instantaneous battlefield with fewer troops. We quit discussing the ends of war. And so what's important in the narrative that both Rory and I discussed today is how you construct that narrative really constructs and shapes the way in which we view history, progress, technology, war, destruction, and humanity. And now I'll move on to Reagan's Star Wars. So this was the Strategic Defense Initiative, which essentially was going to rid the US of the threat of Soviet nuclear weapons because we would have a space defense system which would shoot down anything. Becoming more pertinent today with North Korea, and there's talks of this thing. So the way in which Reagan framed the narrative on selling this massively expensive project to a hesitant Congress really flected this kind of American zeal and American technological innovation. You know, he said in the, in the 1900s, we would have never thought we would fly. And then we put a man on the moon. You know, so kind of this rhetoric given in a very movie theater actor, <laughs> movie actor essence of Reagan with the quite patriotic fervor as well. And so what's interesting about Star Wars is it wasn't actually technologically feasible at the time, but it was a technological solution to eliminate the security problem mixed with this patriotic destiny. So Reagan's Star Wars was a populist dream. The ultimate technological fix, the all singing, all dancing, all praying, all answering machine, it is struck at the gusher of American rhetoric. It evokes a golden, nostalgic past before the bomb, at the same time appeals to generations brought up on sci-fi and computer games. It combines the citizen's faith that whatever the US of A does must be moral, and that the bomb is God's gift to protect the free world with the energetic and innovative nature of the American tradition, of fixing things and looking for technological solutions to political, social, or even psychological problems. And after the end of the Cold War, we move on to the Gulf War, which was the ultimate easy war, as many have put it. We had the rise of precision-guided munitions. We had increased range. The war was won very quickly with minimal casualties on the US side. We had an increased ab ability to gather and process information. War became easy on the conscience, as it did on the pocketbooks. This is a danger for perpetual war, when it becomes both easy morally and easy monetarily. We have no sense that we'll have to bear the burden whatsoever in fighting. So the Gulf War epitomizes the ethical war. Speed, efficiency, absolute victory, thanks to technology. And it's interesting, General Schwarzkopf the head uh, commander of the Gulf War, actually had a triumphalist victory parade on the streets of Disneyland. So not too far from here. <laughs> and this triumphalist victory, yeah, what better place than Disneyland to have a military celebration? Um, as a result of this, thinkers in the just war tradition developed a new category of just war, which is use post bellum, so justice after war. How do you become a good victor, a moral victor, not this kind of triumphalist celebration? And with that, we had precision-guided munitions, which we used about 7% during the Kosovo bombing, 35% during the Gulf War, um, and then up to 70% by the beginning of the Iraq War in 2003 during our Shop Ganok campaign. So the idea and the language of precision-guided munitions is actually somewhat deceiving, and intentionally so. The idea that these missiles were so precise that we could be ethical in warfare. So in 2003, when we had our first bombing of Iraq, these missiles that we used had a 50% circular error probable. Now, in military jargon, that essentially means 50% of the time, it will hit within a 10 meter radius of where you expect it to hit. Now, in intense urban areas, 10 meters is the difference between a hospital and a military installation and 50% of the time it would hit somewhere else. Right? So this language of precision, even that we use today in drone warfare, is very deceptive. The idea that we can send a bomb through a window, especially at the beginning of the Iraq War, was very much an illusion. Now, 
Another interesting thing happened during the Shock and Awe campaign. We debuted a statistical program called the Collateral Damage Assessment Tool. And essentially what it was is we would run a computer stats package to determine the probability of civilian casualties in a given airstrike. The problem with this is it was too slow. So what we did is we developed FAST CD 2.0 and a million other acronyms that the military has. And what's interesting from the perspective of the military is, as Brigadier General Kopik said, it will allow us to target facilities with confidence we're not going to cause civilian casualties. So ethics is no longer due care or practical judgment of the military leaders. What it's become is a keystroke algorithm. Well, we killed 50 civilians, but we ran the algorithm and it said we'd only kill 10. We're not ethically responsible. It was unintentional. And this technology has a real allure to it. You can see, of course, it's better that we run these algorithms, right? It's better that we think about who we may kill in a given strike and maybe change the munition size, et cetera. But this, it gives us this allure and this false sense that we're following the rules of war and it absolves us of responsibility in a way that I find quite problematic. So General Tommy Franks, who led the shock and awe campaign. Uh, we ran, we were doing about 30 strikes on the first night during the shock and awe. And 22 of them had high probability of collateral damage, which was the arbitrary ceiling of about 30 civilian casualties. And what General Tommy Franks said when the people launching the missiles came to him and said, we're going to have 22 cases of high collateral damage out of the 30 strikes. He said, go ahead, we're doing all 30. So you can see the keystroke becomes ethics, whereas exercising due care in warfare has been reduced to a technological problem to be solved. And now we come to drones. The advent of drones, first used for surveillance, then after 9-11, we armed them with Hellfire missiles, you know, which we deem to be precise, but Hellfires are anti-tank munitions, so pretty large blast radius when you're firing it into a group of a few people. Um, and the rise of drones actually happened under Obama. So with Bush, he conducted, he used them in... Iraq and Afghanistan, just like you would any other weapon. But where it becomes problematic is when you use these drones outside of declared battlefields, specifically Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. So under Bush, we had 57 strikes in these in-between zones, non-war zones of these countries. He killed about 296 terrorists, 195 civilians. Whereas Obama had 563 strikes, over 10 times the amount. And any time he talked about this very secretive CIA program, he would always refer to them as surgical instruments, right? We have surgical strikes, precise weapons. So again, you're appealing to the technological ability to kill more discreetly than in Vietnam or past wars as a production of being ethical in war. And again, we have this language of precision and appeal to technology. But the problem is it's only as precise as our intelligence that goes into it. You may be able now to hit what you're aiming at, unlike before, but a lot of times you don't really know what you're aiming at. And a couple of years ago, it was leaked the CIA ways of determining targets in Yemen and Pakistan, which for Terminator fans, it was actually called Skynet, which whichever evil person came up with that, Essentially, what we would do is the CIA would team up with the NSA. What they would do is they would fly drones over these tribal areas of Yemen and Pakistan. And with that, they would gather up SIM card data and pump it through a machine learning algorithm in order to determine the probability of your terroristness. So what it would do is it would essentially hone in on 80 points of your SIM card. Who are you traveling with? Do you power down your phone frequently? Who are your contacts? Who are you calling, et cetera? 80 of those, and essentially an advanced version of how Netflix determines your next show is how we would determine 
your probability of terroristness. So this idea that drones can hit what they're aiming at is true, but what we're aiming at is now the question. And again, the technological fix of the problem of determining who to strike in these areas where we don't have intelligence assets on the ground. And even if we do, they're not reliable. And then we move to today in the war against ISIS. Again, I'm brushing over a lot of things, but anecdotal evidence is still evidence, right? To the war against ISIS called Operation Inherent Resolve. Most of us has probably never heard of that. We've heard about bombing ISIS, but we've been bombing in Syria and Iraq against ISIS for 1,105 days. 24,565 manned airstrikes. So these are planes dropping bombs at a cost of $13.6 million per day. 1,000 days at $13.6 million per day. These things are never debated. We debate this if you want to give someone health care, something else, but dropping bombs is never debated. There's always a blank check for that. And before we move on to Trump, um, <laughs> which is fun for us, um, I want to talk a little bit about you know, the drones in the exhibition. You know, and Ben uses those to demonstrate on the one hand, the kind of beauty and allure of this kind of inhuman machine, but at the same time, also a reminder that we've been engaged in the longest war in US history, and most of us wouldn't even know it as we wake up every morning. Right? We don't think about these things. All we hear about is whatever our tweeter in chief said the night before. Right? And it's hard to keep up with whichever scandal is occurring that day, and it's easy to forget this scandal from four scandals ago. But Obama was no saint either. <laughs> and at least you see a bit more criticism now that Trump has risen. But for example, in Obama's last month, he launched 462 drone strikes in Afghanistan in December of 2016. And then Trump comes to office and, needless to say, blows it all out of the water. So with Trump, we have the absence of a grand strategy. So what that is is essentially a doctrine like was so important in World War II to win, designed to impose America's will on the world, not the other way around. And the way in which Trump views his doctrine is just short-term transactionalism, short-term tactical wins rather than long-term strategic foresight. So for example, after Assad launched a small chemical weapons attack killing about 80 people, Trump lobbed 59 million Tomahawk missiles at the Syrian air base where the attack came from. Right? And he was praised by liberals. It was the first time he acted presidential. But the missiles in response to the chemical attack were pretty ineffective. You could launch planes from there the next day. And the only ones who really benefited were Raytheon, who creates the Tomahawk missiles and all the other defense contractors. Overnight, their stocks rose $5 billion the night after Trump launched those in preparation for a war. So the only winners of this transactionalism are whoever profits from war. So there are a couple people who have done really good work recently, Mike Zenko and Jennifer Wilson, on kind of keeping track of how much bombing Trump is really doing. So for example, in the first six months under Trump, uh, we've launched 20,650 bombs. That's 80% more than Obama did in all of 2016. In July, Trump dropped 77% more bombs than Obama did last July. And outside of declared war zones in Yemen, Pakistan, and Somalia, in the last 193 days of Obama, there were 21 lethal counterterrorism operations. And Trump quintupled that. We've had 96 operations in Yemen, seven in Somalia, and four in Pakistan. So we're definitely increasing in every aspect of our counterterrorism war. Not only that, our tolerance for civilian casualties has rose. You know, even the military's own estimates, civilian casualties have soared. And independent estimates have them as much as 10 times as high as during the Obama era. Not only that, we're gutting the State Department as much by 30%, so you're getting rid of all of your experts in the area 
which is really key. And even military generals will tell you this. Military can give you strategic and military victories. It can't solve political problems. You cannot bomb your way to political solutions. And military commanders are aware of this. But we keep cutting funding for the State Department, which are the diplomats who end up winning the wars because you can't win a war without political so solutions. So to wrap up a little bit after that depressing talk, <laughs> um, I want to discuss how we kind of have an antidote to this idea that technology is creating war as an inherently more ethical space by kind of a renewed sense of humanism. So in my work, I try to push back against the idea that collateral damage estimation algorithms or Skynet algorithms to determine your terroristness can absolve us of the responsibility of acting ethical in warfare. So in order to do this, I think there are a few things that really are essential to that. And in order to evoke this kind of humanistic imagination in the age where anything is technologically possible, we need a few things. We need art, poetry, and a little bit of humanism. So to get a little existential, Jean-Paul Sartre um, talks about how man is really condemned to be free. Everyone carries the weight of the world on their shoulders and especially those who are in the military. When a military leader orders an attack, he sends men to their death, and it's he alone who chooses. Of course, there's no doubt higher commands, but those are kind of more general rules upon which the individual co commanders need to interpret. And th this decision-making should and does lead to anguish. Every leader should feel that anguish when you are sending other people to die in your place. That's the very condition of action in this world, especially in warfare. It is a direct responsibility from which technologically has offered us an escape from. Technology has become that escape from anguish. And that's what General Tommy Franks talked about during shock and awe. Go ahead, we're doing all 30. He didn't feel that angst because he wasn't putting anyone in harm's way. They were pushing a button to launch missiles into a densely populated urban area. So it's only through art, poetry, and the narrative of those who have fought in war that we can bring back the human element of war. And it's especially interesting to, when you go upstairs to see the uh, Keinholz exhibition, and especially the Jungen, to reimagine the life of a Nazi soldier. And if you read the biographies of even Nazi soldiers, there's a good one called The Forgotten Soldier, you can see the shared experience that soldiers have. You know? Whatever side they were fighting on, you know, they were young, they were ignorant, they were patriotic, and they had a shared experience in war. And the more war biographies you read, and the more you listen to their narratives, the more you can really understand, one, the horrors of war, and two, how it's just everyone fighting for the people around them and their own survival. And the president of Harvard, Drew Gilpin Faust, talked about the seductiveness of those of us who study war. People always ask me, you know, how do you sleep at night? How, how do you, when you study all these things, all this death and destruction, how do you kind of compartmentalize it and put it out? And I think the seductiveness of, for those of us who study war is that it's really at the boundary of the human, the inhuman, and the superhuman. It requires us to confront the relationship among the noble, the horror, the infinite, the animal, the spiritual, and divine. And I think it's really only art, poetry, and narrative uh, that are the necessary tools for us to grapple uh, with this complex, uh, with these complex dilemmas. So I was not going to read this Vonnegut quote um, to finish until I saw the exhibition upstairs. And if you haven't seen it, it's basically child doll heads juxtaposed with helmets and other things like that. And there's a great quote from Slaughterhouse-Five that I think really speaks to that, so I wanted to share that first. Um, so it was a movie about American bombers in World War II and the gallant men who flew them, seen backwards by Billy, and the story went like this. So the backward story of World War II. American planes, full of holes and wounded men and corpses, took off backwards from an airfield in England 
Over France, a few German fighter planes flew at them backwards, sucked bullets and shell fragments from some of the planes and crewmen. They did the same for wrecked American bombers on the ground, and those planes joined the formation. The formation flew backwards over a German city that was in flames. The bombers opened their bomb bay doors, exerted a miraculous magnetism which shrunk the fires, gathered them into cylindrical steel containers, and lifted the containers into the bellies of the planes. The containers were stored neatly in racks. The Germans below had miraculous devices of their own, which were long steel tubes. They used them to suck more fragments from the crewmen and planes. But there were still a few wounded Americans, though, and some of the bombers were in bad repair. Over France, though, German fighters came up again and made everything and everybody good as new. When the bombers got back to their base, the steel cylinders were taken from the racks and shipped back to the United States of America, where the factories were operating day and night, dismantling the cylinders, separating the dangerous contents into minerals. Touchingly, it was mainly women who did this work. The minerals were then shipped to specialists in remote areas. It was the, their business to put them into the ground and to hide them cleverly so they would never hurt anybody again. So thank you for your time and attention. So, yeah. you're right. okay. so in the 80s, I was um, a student at the University of Michigan in graduate school, and I had a professor, Raymond Tanter, who worked with the Reagan administration on strategic arms limitation talks. And in the old days, you could have nation states with agreements to prohibit this mutually assured destruction with nuclear weapons. Today, Richard Clark, uh, who's an NSA, whatever, yeah, he was a big guy in NSA, he's on TV a lot. He mentioned recently that today, and you didn't mention anything, by the way, about cyber, my background's, yeah. in, my background's no in counter terrorism, yeah. but cyber terrorism. <laughs> so Richard Clark said, well, today we can have agreements between nation states to prohibit cyber warfare. But what he left out is all the rogue players that have no identity with any nation states who in a moment five minutes from now could turn the entire world upside down. Any comments on, on that new technology that, or more, more recent technology today and the destructive nature of that? So Richard Clark is interesting. Um, he is on TV a lot more. His work's become a lot more relevant. Um, but he was actually one uh, who was very instrumental in arming drones after 9-11. So he feels a little bit of guilt for the, that kind of decision. He didn't really realize the Pandora's box. And that's the interesting thing about cyber warfare, et cetera, is that you really don't always know who it comes from, where it comes from, you know, individuals, especially, you know, cr crime organizations, et cetera. So it's really hard to put regulations in place. Yeah, you can have regulations and treaties about mutually assured destruction and nukes and things like that, but in the end, states can decide to break them any time. A treaty is only as good as long as the state wants it to be, to be a little Machiavellian, I guess. But in terms of cyber warfare, you have a lot more vulnerabilities, um, and there's really no way to police it. Same thing with drones today. Even hobby drones have been used by ISIS. Like the ones you can buy on Amazon for a few hundred dollars, they attach grenades to and then fly them in. And they also use it to see where the you know, Iraqi army positions are. So the proliferation of technology and the cheap access to it, that any 15-year-old with enough tech skills can hack the Pentagon, uh, <laughs> um, makes it to where it's really kind of flattening the hierarchies of power and warfare. And the people who study cyber warfare are terrified all the time. I don't study it. Um, <laughs> so I'm scared enough, usually. So, um, But they're terrified. <laughs> good reason. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I, I just... To add to that, there's, I mean, a lot of this is, is bound up with the idea of fourth generation warfare. And the, interestingly enough, the people who are at the forefront of um, cyber defense 
are, are the, the Finns, um, mainly because they are attacked on a daily basis uh, through cyber means by the Russians. And of course, the Finns with, you know, due you know, reasonable cause are, are, are still a little bit worried about one day being reinvaded by Russia. Now, the interesting thing is that although the Finland, the Finns have taken a sort of a, a, a forward stance in creating various cyber defenses, they have absolutely no cyber strategy. And what I mean by that is that they have software and, and, and responses in, and defenses in place, but they have no idea how to integrate that with more traditional uh, military defenses, i.e. troops on the ground, even drones in the air. And I think the one thing that the military strategists still haven't got to grips with, uh, and because it is so complex, is how you integrate cyber warfare with traditional infantry units, with naval units, and with, and with air, air force units as well, whether that's manned or unmanned. Um, there will undoubtedly be progress on that it, it, as we go forward. But I think John's right in saying that, you know, yes, the, 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 the technology is so diffused. Um, and as, as he also says, you know, states may sign treaties, but treaties are there to be broken usually when it becomes advantageous. You know, and, and a lot of the, the cyber technology out there has been released by states because they want increased chatter to hide their own activities in, in the dark web. So, you know, it, it is a kind of a, <laughs> it's a, it's a vicious circle, literally. Um, uh, and I think that's the problem that we still, we, st we, we, we can't strategize because we still don't even understand the, the problem yet, I think, to its full extent. With that flattening as well, it was interesting after the Edward Snowden uh, release of how much the NSA was essentially spying on people, there was an Australian hacker group that got together and essentially ran servers all the time of basically searching how to build bombs, you know, all these things that would trigger red flags within the NSA dragnet. And they did this in order to essentially overload the system in order to make it the entire system ineffective in some sense. So you see like the kind of activist hackers on one, t on one side trying to undermine these systems of the state as well as you know, terrorist groups and other crime organizations and subver subversive states to use them to their own military advantage. So it's a flattening for sure. So you mentioned uh, just war, and I would assume that every country believes that the war that they're fighting is just, right? Has there ever been uh, an honest nation state that <laughs> just says, we have weapons and we have technology, and we're going to take your resources because of that? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> so this is a question I, it's a very good question, it's a, and it's a question I get asked quite frequently is, you know, when I say, I, you know, I study just war and, and and if people sometimes people say what you just study war and i'm no no i studied just war as in, and then they say what well, is there such a thing as a just war is has there ever been a just war and my answer is well it's two sides of the same coin is either there's never been a just war or every single war is just and because justice is subjective okay so there is no i well, at least i do not believe there is such a thing as objective universal justice that is applicable across time or across every culture at any particular time. The reason why I think the idea of a just war or justifiable violence um, is created is, well, it, it's twofold. The first, of, the first fold is because it is necessary for communities to think themselves as just. I think as human beings, we compete against other political communities. Now that might be on a very small basis or maybe on a very grand scale, like today's large sovereign nation states. But every community has to believe that it is at least equal, if not superior, to its competitors. Otherwise, you would simply leave that community and go and join someone else, right? Now that is particularly true when you start killing people. There's, there's, actually, there's, there's a fair amount of research about the that most humans, there's a very interesting book by called, mm -hmm. guy called David Grossman, who's an army psychologist, called On Killing. And he, he basically has argues that most people have uh, an, an inherent um, adversion, aversion uh, and abhorrence to killing a fellow human. And actually to get a soldier to kill 
takes really scientific and systematic training. You have to essentially have to deconstruct that inherent aversion and reconstruct a killing machine. And that has only really been successful in the 20th century, and arguably even only the late 20th century. Um, and even in the 20th century and before that, n it's estimated that 90% of kills are, are, are done by 10% of troops. So in other words, you have a 10% portion of, the, of, of society that perhaps lack, whether it's empathy, sympathy, whatever, that perhaps lack that aversion and abhorrence. And they are responsible for most deaths in war. Um, <coughs> that has started, only really started to change in the last few decades where you have incredibly technical and systematic training for soldiers. But, you know, Grossman, you know, talks about it's more emotionally uh, difficult to get a soldier to stab someone than to slice someone. And obviously shooting someone's easier than stabbing them because it's removed. So I think there's an, there's an, there's an inbuilt human... Um, aversion to, to committing violence against others. And to persuade people to do that, therefore, you have to persuade them that they're doing it for a reason and for a good reason. Because le let's remember that most of the wars throughout history, you know, it's not just a ruler or an elite fighting. It is a ruler and an, an elite getting other people either to fight with them or to fight for them. So to do that, you have to persuade them. Um, and you and you use and you d and you persuade them through creating very complex ideas of justice and and morality. Um, and I said, and if you and if you bind that up with religion, which again has been a major dominant factor throughout most human cultures and remains so today, especially in, in this country, then you have to justify that violence and say you can do this, and you're not going to go to hell, or you can do this and you can still enjoy an afterlife. So I think, so this idea of justice is, is important because you have to persuade other people to do it, but it also becomes a need for the community itself to believe itself as superior. Now, so the, the answer, you know, is there a just war? Well, yes, I mean, as I, every war is just according to the people who fight it. Very few people would engage in a war thinking, saying, this is a really evil cause. I'm going to go and kill people for it, you know. Some people are mercenary and, and you know, and, and, and venal and greedy and perhaps may well do that and just, you know, psychopathic. But, but that is not the majority of, of the population. Equally, those who are the victims of war believe that it is usually unjust. That's the entire idea of victimhood, right? You usually don't think, oh, I really deserved to be bombed today, you know, or I really deserve to lose this war and be enslaved, or I really deserve to have my, you know, house blown apart and my daughter or son or, or mother or brother or sister killed. So, you know, justice and, inju uh, and injustice are, are completely arbitrary ideas in, in many ways, and they are dependent upon one's point of view. Um, the thing which I was going to talk about and, 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 and forgot to, as I was getting carried away, um, was um, I mentioned Cicero's idea of just cause and proper authority um, as kind of the two major principles for deciding whether a war is just or not. I, as a private individual, I do not have authority to declare war. People just think I'm a psychopath. I, to have authority, I have to represent a community. I have to have some idea of sovereignty. To have cause, there has to be an idea of an injury done against me. You know, uh, an injustice has been committed and therefore has to be put right. The third pillar, I suppose, of the just war tradition was introduced through Christian intervention, and that was the idea of correct intention. This was the sense that you can't go to war for vengeance, for lust to dominate, for greed. That actually the only reason that you could go to war is this, yes, you had to have a just cause, you had to have received an injury, but that you had to go to war because you were doing it for justice, because you were doing it for love, and that included love of the enemy, and that it was a self-sacrificing motive rather than a personally enriching motive. You know, that you were putting your life on the line in order to correct an injustice. And I think this is the problem with, with perhaps m m the way the modern <coughs> war is conceived, is that in the pre-modern world, there was this sense that you had to have correct intention and that violence could be used 
for either immoral or moral purposes. Violence in itself was not evil. It's how you use that violence. Violence was seen as necessary in some situations to cure an evil, but it could also be used for bad reasons as well. In today's world, and according to the UN charters, the only reason for using violence now is self-defense. Yeah, that, that's technically, you either have defensive wars or you have aggressive wars. There is no sense of states having a right to punish other states for injustices. And this was because of the idea of inviolable state sovereignty. Now, that's all very well in theory. But the problem is it doesn't work in practice because we have something called intervention. <laughs> yeah, And the, this idea of humanitarian intervention in, in and of itself is essentially a state making a decision and a judgment to say that I'm going to interfere because I believe there are injustices being committed in this separate sovereign state. Now, therefore, that is assuming a right to make judgments about justice, even if you're not being harmed yourself. So the, it's, 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 it's a bastardization of this idea of self-defense because there isn't a right to intervene in many ways, although there's now this policy called the right to protect. But there being the only way you can do that is to justify it on ideas of self-defense. And that, so, you, def, you, so you, you, you wage war in order to avoid a potential future harm. And of course, this can be manipulated and, it, it, and, and, and used in, in, in incredibly um, cynical ways <coughs> very, very easily. And arguably, that's what we're seeing in a number of cases all over the world today, um, Crimea, Syria, you could say the second invasion of Iraq okay, and Afghanistan. So. I know um, that George Bush is probably never going to be held accountable for saying that you know uh, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, right? But apparently in England, what's the who was the prime minister back then? Uh, Tony Blair. Tony Blair is being questioned about that. Yeah, I mean, people are saying that they're going to try to take him to the International Criminal Court and uh, to sue him as a, as a war criminal. Um, it's fantastical. It, it will never happen. And to be honest with you, uh, I don't think within international law there would be grounds to do it. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on modern international law, but effectively they justified that invasion on the grounds of self-defense under Article 51 of the United Nations uh, Charter. Um, now, if you, if, you, if you argued that that was groundless, that there was no inherent threat, then you could say that it is an illegal war. But even if you say it's an illegal war, you know, Blair was the head of a sovereign state and the state system that we have in the world today basically declares that states have a right to identify their uh, threats to themselves. So to take him to the International Criminal Court would be problematic to say. I mean, it's never going to happen. Um, as much as some people might like to see it happen, and I, I'm not, I don't know where I would sit. Where I'd probably sit somewhere in the middle. Uh, it's the safest place to be. Um, but it, it's not going to happen. And actually, under, the, under our current international law system, I think it would be hard to make it happen. And just to quickly add to that, was there ever a just war? Perhaps, probably. Um, but the reason in which I specifically engage in this just war today is because you saw a rise in the use of just war language, especially in the post 9-11 era, throughout even the presidential debates, and even Obama justifying drone strikes. He said, we're engaged in a just war. It's proportional in last resort, etc." And so what I do, and my advisor Daniel Brunstetter, is we engage in this language with them and look at the just war tradition and say, really, it's not last resort. You haven't reached this threshold of last resort. So they're using the language and essentially what we do is use the language and the knowledge of international law and the tradition to push back against that, to try and, there are those that use the just war tradition to try and limit as much violence as possible. Um, and that's about all you can do. But then there are others that say the just war tradition just enables violence. So even when I engage in the same language, I'm still giving it power. And that's really what doesn't let me sleep at night more often than not. Hi there. 
Um, I was really struck by your statement about studying war is at the boundary of human, inhuman, and superhuman. And a great line, by the way. Um, and all of the pieces we see in the exhibition are technologies that make humans more than human. And we are increasing those technologies through, let's say DARPA is building exoskeletons. So we're gonna be Iron Man. Uh, or my actual research is in brain computer interfaces. So they're doing research in trying to make soldiers, uh, their cognition more than human. Yeah. So I'd love to hear you talk about that um, also, it strikes me is the more more human we become, the more superhuman we become, the fewer people we have to persuade in the just war. We have fewer and fewer combatants. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So I'd love to hear you discuss that. Um, so I can't take cred credit for that quote. It was the president of Harvard and I think her 2011 address. She's a Civil War historian, um, but I thought that was the most apt thing. I added the part about art, poetry, things like that. So I'll take, I'll take credit for that, but she is the one that first at least articulated that boundary. Um, and yeah, it's interesting because what we see through the exhibit is these technologies of war, this kind of distancing of warfare. Right? You can be at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada killing someone in Pakistan on the, the other side of the globe. And when I teach this to my students and ask them, you know, do you think it makes war like a video game, etc., all my students are like, yeah, it's just a video game. But then I play them an interview with a drone pilot, and he talks about how traumatic it was. And you see PTSD re rates amongst drone pilots as well. Because what they'll do is they'll follow around people, sometimes for days on end, watch them play with their kids, and then take them out in the car. And one drone pilot in particular talked about how there were three men that he was following, and he launched a Hellfire missile. Two of them died instantly. The other one lost his leg about at the thigh and he had the thermal imaging on, and he watched the blood squirting out of his leg as he's rolling around, and watched him become the same color as the ground as he bled out. So it's a very intense experience. It's a very human experience, although it's mediated through a screen on the other side of the world with immense distance. And then on top of that, they're at war, and then they go home and pick up their kids from soccer practice, right? So it's this real disconnect from the war front and the home front. And the use of technology and becoming superhuman. I mean, I work at um, UC Irvine, and we get a lot of both Marines and Army Rangers that use their GI Bill to go there. So anytime they take my ethics of war class, I always sit them down for an interview. And one of the common themes, even from World War I memoirs to World War II to the interviews today, is that when they first got hit the ground, they felt like a god, right? They felt superhuman. Even if you didn't have that exoskeleton technology or things to make you more superhuman, you know, they had Red Bull and other things, right? <laughs> to give them that energy to fight constantly, not to mention the adrenaline. And you see that, but then as it starts to develop over time, they can see the inhumanity of it. One of the Marines that I interviewed talked about when he would do night raids in Iraq, you know, he would start to see his uncles and the people that he tied up while they were doing the raids. You know, so you start to see this inhuman element even when it's up close and personal. So there are a lot of boundaries to explore within that and I think millions of books on it and pieces of art and poetry that really touch on that, but I think very few of them can really capture the essence of war in that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned the Blitzkrieg uh, and the, the 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 going through uh, the, the, the forests. I mean, it, it's become evident now, and it's, uh, this may be familiar. I apologise that essentially the Blitzkrieg and the invasion of France was only possible because the German soldiers were being force-fed mass levels of amphetamines. The the tank drivers didn't sleep for five days um, because they were drugged up to their eyeballs on, a, on this cocktail to keep them awake and therefore not having to stop the tanks. And that's how the Blitzkrieg operated. Um, yes, it's true that the number of combatants is decreasing, but that does not mean the number of casualties is decreasing. And actually there's a very, there's a kind of a well-known and slightly dubious statistic, but I think it is reasonably um, representative 
released by the, the Red Cross of, of um, combatant versus non-combatant death and casualties in, in warfare. Now, we usually think of pre-modern war as barbarous and cruel and, and, and horrendous, and modern warfare is much more surgical and so on and so forth and, and, and discriminating. But actually, if you the, the rough statistics and are uh, that in, in pre-modern war, i.e. pre-Napoleonic war, um, out of every 10 deaths, uh, one was a civilian and, and nine was a combatant. By the time you get to the Napoleonic Wars, it's about 50-50. So every 10 deaths, you know, five's a, five are combatant and, and five are non-combatant. By the time you get to the 20th century, and I am absolutely certain this is continuing to rise, the complete reverse has happened. In it, for every 10 deaths, nine are non-combatant and one are combatant. Now, this is partly to do with what John was talking about earlier, about these algorithms, which are just being used as a way to excuse collateral damage. And collateral damage, let's face it, is just a sterile term for saying killing civilians. Yeah, that's, that's essentially what it is. The other problem that we see is the enhancement well, and this is largely a, a, a product of the, of, sec of the Second World War, Korea, and Vietnam, um, and 24-hour press coverage, um, that the unwillingness of um, nations to see soldiers coming home in body bags. And that has led to a doctrine of force protection. And essentially now, rather than, um, rather than uh, armed forces accepting that they are soldiers and therefore they are the the correct people to be taking risks in war increasingly there's a doctrine that you protect your soldiers at all cost even if that includes enhanced risk to civilians so yes you're right that the number of combatants is dropping but that does not mean the number of casualties is dropping and i think that's really worrying and actually i would go all the way back to homer <laughs> when achilles <laughs> achilles basically becomes this superhuman embodiment of war and that's that's really um sort of enhanced when he's given the shield with the depiction of war on it and it's at that moment that he essentially loses his humanity and he just becomes rage and that's what the iliad is all about it's it's a, it's a story and there's one more question back there inside it's around the corner. In here. Yeah. hello hi um I guess I have a question really about semantics. Um, a few times this evening you've talked about um, being humane and uh, humanity and, uh, and the implications that that word has around kind of, I guess, a kind of anti-war type um, notions. And I, I guess I really want to question why we still employ that type of language when it seems so contrary to everything that humanity has displayed um, f throughout time. And to get your thoughts on that. Shall I, shall I stop? Um, uh, not, not stupidity, I, I think fear it would be the, I think it's fear that makes men brave in war. Um, it's fear of the repercussions of what they do if they turn around and run away, i.e. they probably get shot for being uh, a deserter. But actually, I think far more potent is fear of um, their peer group, of their peer group. That you fight in war, like, as John says, you, we, I mean, I've never been in war, but you know, reading many accounts of war and, and memoirs from war, and men fight in war and, and continue to fight in war because of the people immediately around them. And the thought of betraying them or being a coward and, and running off and not standing next to them and not doing their part um, for the comrades who they've, they've fought with already and shared these horrendous you know, emotional experiences, I think that goes much further to explain why, why people, you know, whether it's men or women, you know, obviously women are now fighting on the front line. Um, why they they choose to st to stand there and <laughs> effectively become cannon fodder? It's it's fear, but it's 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 a negative fear, but it's also a positive fear, I suppose, in that way. Um, so that that would be my answer to that. Um, for the the Chelsea Manning, personally, that that hasn't affected my work, um, but um, that's because I, I guess I more of a historical approach to these things rather than um, a, a very, very contemporary social science approach. Uh, it, it may well have affected John's work more. Um, 
I think, can I come back to the inhumanity? I just want to think about that a little bit more. <laughs> um, so pretty much a lot of the contemporary work um, that those of us that study you know, warfare, surveillance, et cetera, either Chelsea Manning or Edward Snowden or, you know, kind of some of the initial initial WikiLeaks on, um, you know, embassy cables, things like that. It's very impactful because these are secret programs, right? You can get once in a while someone from the program leaking to the Washington Post or New York Times, but it's really tough to get a holistic picture of really the depth of it. And especially like the Snowden NSA surveillance was huge. And, you know, the Chelsea Manning um, uh, video leak uh, that came out um, called Collateral Murder, where essentially a helicopter took out some Reuters journalists in Iraq, you know, it was, that was very powerful. The vast majority of people didn't go through any of the leaks. Tons of academics did, you know, and that's where, you know, a lot more people like the Edward Snowden model, where he took the essentially all the millions of documents and brought them to journalists for them to sift through and then determine what was important instead of the Assange model, which is just put everything out there because no one really goes through all those millions of documents. So it's very influential for me. The idea of humanity in humanity and this language of humanism in war is very prominent and I find it hugely problematic. You know, we justify, you know, for humanitarian intervention, Humanitarian bombing, that's a thing. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on bombs when really you could just drop hundreds of thousand dollars in aid and probably make a lot more difference than bombs could. Right? You hear people all throughout, you know, even Teddy Roosevelt justifying imperialism as a gift to humanity. Right? And today you hear about, there's one scholar, I won't name him, um, who calls the drone the most humanitarian weapon ever created. You know, Lewisite, the most abhorrent chemical weapon ever, was viewed as humanitarian. I think it's kind of, on the one sense, psychological that these people who create these machines of death have to justify it somehow and to push the button to say, you know, we are more humane in war. This is for a greater good. This will decrease civilian casualties. So it's making war a more ethical space. And you hear this sort of language used all the time. I think it's used extremely problematically. So I engage with it in order to bring the human elements back into war. Yeah, I mean, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, semantics and, and language is hugely important. I suppose m maybe I would ask a question back would be that what language would we use to take its place? Assuming that we've not yet reached a sort of Star Trek-esque utopia of world government and that societies probably will engage in, in violence um, for a good while yet, some perhaps more legitimate than others, we only have a certain vocabulary available to us, right? And, and, and cultural norms determine what vocabulary is available to us. So I suppose my, my question would be, well, what's the alternative? Is it, is it an honest use of that vocabulary? No, but politics isn't honest and war is political. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, so I haven't got a good answer for you basically, um, but I think we do it because so there's a certain amount of the politicians use language that they themselves don't understand. They use language that is expedient and they use language which is popular. And it really doesn't go much further than that. The, 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 the accuracy of that language and the honesty of that language is highly debatable. And, and it should be debated. I mean, war is the most horrific thing that we can engage in and it should be debated. And that's the importance of how language constructs our reality. Like I talked about precision guided munitions, it gives you this idea that we're far more precise, but anyone who actually knows how those function, they're anything but precise, but it gives you this kind of sense of security. And I don't think it's a surprise that the president with the tiniest hands launched the mother of all bombs 
in Afghanistan, the largest non-nuclear weapon that we've ever created, right? We won't go into the Freudian psychoanalysis of why he did that, but you know, language we use is important. Like the idea that we, the, the system that we use and the algorithm that we use to determine who to kill next is called Skynet from Terminator, right? Language is important because it structures our reality. And in terms of war, it's structured for a purpose, and that's the continuation of war and the justification of war.